We are continuing our study in the book of 1 Timothy, and today we're going to be talking about the characteristics of false teachers. Now, Paul has mentioned false teachers before uh, in this book, but we're going to talk about them some more. But before we do that, just a little recap here. Last week in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul wrote the passage to Timothy as a corrective for the Ephesian congregation. Apparently, the congregation was struggling to sustain a biblical work ethic in the world of slavery. To help direct them in this vital area, he addressed two simple points. Number one, serving a non-Christian master, and number two, serving a Christian master. The instruction he gave is vital to any Christian employee in any social system. <coughs> Now today, in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul writes these verses to teach Timothy how to diagnose satanic darkness masquerading as divine light. He gives seven characteristics or symptoms that identify those infected with spiritual disease of false teaching. Number one, their mark. Number two, their attitude. Number three, their mentality. Number four, their effects. Number five, their cause. Number six, their condition. And number seven, their motive. Every leader in the church should be able to discern deviation from spiritual health. Matter of fact, every Christian should be able to do that. Only then will we be equipped to diagnose the deadly disease of false teaching which is rampant in our country today, amen, and across the world. It is just growing. And, uh, and so we need to uh, be able to check that among our people so we can help those that we serve. Paul warned of the central danger of satanic lies, describing their purveyors as, he says, false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. Second Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15. Again, you see that so rampant in our country today. And when I uh, was reading it, I thought of the, uh, the Mormon religion the cult of Mormonism, how that is so deceiving. And you can go back and read about Joseph Smith and how that he saw a big bright light and voices spoke to him. Well, guess what it was? It wasn't Jesus and it wasn't God. It was the devil. It was Satan uh, masquerading as a light, but in reality he is total darkness. It takes careful discernment to see that those so-called light is really darkness. Therefore, Paul instructs Timothy how to diagnose satanic darkness masquerading as light. First of all, in verse 3, Paul reveals the mark of false teachers. He declares, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Well, Paul now turns attention to those who might be disposed to teach new and strange doctrines in the church. You see, physical diseases have symptoms. Amen? Physical diseases have symptoms, or marks, you might say, by which they may be diagnosed. The same is true of false teaching. Those infected by it will manifest certain characteristics. And that's what we're looking at here today. But the word if here introduces a first class condition clause and assumes reality. In other words, there were already some in Ephesus who were Errors of false teaching. This was going on already in the church at Ephesus. The term anyone indicates 
Paul did not want to limit his war warning to any specific teaching or teachers. He gives a generic warning embracing all false teaching. It includes everything Timothy was facing there at Timothy or at Ephesus, as well as all the false teaching the church would subsequently face or encounter in the future. The first mark or characteristic of false teachers is what they affirm. A false teacher, Paul says, teaches otherwise. Well, what does that mean? Well, or you might say he advocates a different doctrine. The phrase teaches otherwise is a compound word that means to teach a doctrine different from one's own. It describes any teaching that contradicts God's revelation in Scripture. Such teaching is heterodoxy rather than orthodoxy. <coughs> false teaching may take any, many, many forms, as we know. We, you can mention a lot of false religions and teachings uh, across our world and country. They take many forms. To spot the carers of false teaching in which is spiritual disease, believers must be well grounded in Scripture. You heard me saying before, what it, when they, for, for people to teach others to um, notice or identify uh, false currency, uh, what are they teaching to do? You study the real one, right? Uh, the counterfeit, yeah, you said that a little bit, but if you really want to know how to, to notice counterfeit or false dollar bills or whatever, you study the original. Well, if you want to know and really be able to understand false teaching, you study the original. Amen? This is where we need to be in here, in God's Word. Now, if you want to memorize anything, memorize this. It will be, it'll be you much, much good and help you in times to come. Those who know the Word will easily spot teaching contrary to it. 1 John 2.14 gives us an example of those grounded in the Word. John says, I have written to you young men because you are strong, and the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Since the evil one primarily operates in the false systems of religion, this indicates a level of maturity where sound doctrine has been laid as a solid foundation. Those who have grown past being spiritual infants through their knowledge of doctrine or sound doctrine can see error for what it is. So as we grow in our walk with the Lord, as we grow in our knowledge of God's Word, we will be able to spot false teaching and error. Another mark of or characteristic of false teachers is what they deny. Their teaching not only affirms error, but also, Paul says, does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The phrase consent to is in the present tense, indicating false teachers are in a continuous state of not agreeing with sound words. Well, what, is, what are sound words? Well, what does that mean? Well, the Greek term for the word sound means to be healthy or physically whole. It is from which the English word hygiene derives. Therefore, when you put that together, false teachers are not in Greek, but spiritually wholesome and beneficial words. That believers need to pay attention to sound, healthy teaching is repeatedly emphasized by Paul in the pastoral epistles. Paul further describes sound words as even words of our Lord Jesus Christ. That phrase refers to more than just quotes of our Lord in the Gospels. It has to do more than just that. It encompasses his messages as revealed in Scripture, the Word of Christ. It is that word that provides a healthy teaching by which every believer can grow. Peter wrote, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2, 2. How do we grow? By getting in God's word, applying it to our life, we will grow in more like him. 
False teachers are not, are not committed to Scripture. Oh, they say that they are, and they think they know everything, but they are not. They may speak of Jesus and the Father, but the heart of their ministry will not be the actual Word of God. They will either add to it, take away from it, interpret it in some heretical fashion, add other revelations to it, or deny it altogether. Amen? That's what you see in false teachers. That was very thing. A third characteristic of false teachers is that their reject is their rejection of the doctrine which accords with godliness. The ultimate test of any teaching is whether it produces godliness. Teaching not based on scripture will result in an unholy life. The term godliness means piety reverence or likeness to God. Such behavior is the fruit of truth. Praise God for truth. In Matthew 7 15 to 20, Jesus warned, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You see, instead of godliness, their lives, the lives of the false teachers will be characterized by sin. Oh, they'll try to hide it for a while and try to look real good, but sooner or later, the Bible says your sins will do what? Find you out. They will come to the surface. It will uh, let you know what you are. Peter graphically describes them as he says this in 2 Peter 2, verses 10 through 17. Again, talking about these false teachers, he says... These are those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. He goes on to, he goes on to say that, but these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained to covet practices and are accursed children. They have forgotten or forsaken the right way and have gone astray. And he ends by saying, These are wells without water, clouds carried about by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Wow, what a description of false teachers. Heresy, you see, heresy has no power to produce genuine godliness. Amen? Sooner or later, it will come out. And I, I, I have several men names in my mind right now that, that I, this has happened to. I've seen it in their lives across our country and even some in our own fellowship. Next, in the first part of verse 4, Paul reveals the attitude of false teaching. He declares his three words. He is proud, or they are proud. The attitude of false teachers can be summed up in one word, pride. The term proud here derives from a root word meaning smoke. This is interesting. The verb means to puff up like a cloud of smoke. In English slang, we would describe such a person as blowing smoke or full of hot air. <laughs> and I, I think I probably used that <laughs> or heard it anyway. That word also implies arrogance an inevitable mark of false teachers. It takes an immense ego 
to place oneself as judge of the Bible. Such egotism blatantly usurps the place of God. False teachers speak arrogant words of vanity, according to 2 Peter 2.18, useless talk that merely reveals their arrogant attitude. Paul describes such one as inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Colossians 2.18. Dr. Arthur Dr. Stuart Scott gives some insight on pride. He says, quote, Someone who is proud, he or she is focused on self. This is a form of self-worship. Prideful people believe that they are or should be the source of what is good, right, and worthy of praise. They also believe that they, by themselves, are or should be the accomplisher of anything that is worthwhile to accomplish, and that they should certainly be the benefactor of all things. In essence, they are believing that all things should be from them, through them, and to them, or for them. Pride is competitive toward others, and especially toward God. Pride wants to be on top. Thomas Watson is quoted to have said, quote, pride seeks to un-God God. This phrase certainly describes the arrogant, unquote. How true that is. You see, false teachers have an over-inflated sense of their own importance, not hesitating to rebel against God's God and His Word. They merely confirm, however, that they are infected with a deadly spiritual disease. Next, in the second part of verse 4, Paul reveals the mentality, mentality of false teachers. He declares, Knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. So he continues now to describe these false teachers. Although a false teacher may be filled with pride over his supposed knowledge, in reality he understands nothing at all. All of his imagined intelligence, intelligence, pretended scholarship, and supposed deeper insights amounts to foolishness in the eyes of God. Lacking insight into spiritual truth, his wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic, says James, James 3.15. Those who know and believe the Word of God have far more insight into spirituality than the most educated heretic. Instead of focusing on the truth, false teachers are obsessed, Paul says, with disputes and arguments over words. Since false teachers are prideful, prideful and arrogant, their disease involves preoccupation with useless questions and fighting over words. The word obsessed literally means to be sick. It's interesting. To be sick. These men are not spiritually healthy. And instead of teaching healthy words, as in the previous verse, they teach words that produce sick saints. That sickness spreads. You ever notice that? The term disputes refers to idle speculations or questions. And the phrase arguments over words literally means word battles. False teachers do little than quabble over tech, uh, terminology. They indulge in pseudo-intellectual theorizing rather than in productive study of and submission to God's Word. They want to argue and show how smart they are. Such fruitless speculations are ultimately doctrines of demons. <clears throat> to engage in them, in them is a sign of spiritual sickness. Next, in the third part of verse 4, in the first part of verse 5, Paul reveals the effects of false teachers. He declares, From which come envy, strife, violating, evil suspicions, and then useless wranglings. Well, as noted earlier, 
false teaching fails the test of truth because it fails to produce godliness. A second way it fails is in its inability to, to produce unity. The word battles of false teachers result in chaos and confusion. Since, they, since the things they talk about are really not matters of biblical doctrine, there is no way of selling them decisively. As a result, their teaching stirs up, Paul says, envy, strife, reviling, and evil suspicion. So let's kind of look at those individually, see what they mean. Well, envy is the inward discontent with the advantages or popularity enjoyed by others. You envy what others have or what they are or what they're doing. It results in strife which often manifests itself in reviling or the abusive language of slander and insult. That reviling or abusive language consists of evil suspicions, which means to ascribe evil motives to someone. So you just see that spiral downward uh, as they begin to argue and fight over words and things. The phrase useless wranglings refers to perverse disputing, or could be translated, constant friction. The net result of false teaching is constant friction. False teachers constantly rub each other the wrong way. That helps spread their spiritual disease, much as sheep might rub together and infect each other. False teaching can never produce unity. Let me say that again. False teaching can never produce unity. Amen? Only the truth unifies. Praise the Lord. The truth will set you free. Next, in the second part of verse 5, Paul reveals the cause of false teachers. He declares, they are men of corrupt minds, he says. You see, the external cause of false teaching is satanic deception. The internal cause, however, is corrupt minds. The term corrupt means to rot thoroughly, to ruin, decay utterly. These false teachers have depraved or unregenerate, rotten minds. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But Paul's exposing them. And we, especially this day and age, folks, we really need to know this, don't we? I mean, there is so much false teaching and information that we see on, on the news and the radio and the workplace and all around us. I mean, so much deception and people saying all kinds of things. We need to know the truth. Paul writes in Romans 8, 5 through 8, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Such a mind does not function normally in the spiritual realm. It does not react normally to the truth. Being carnal men, false teachers cannot understand the things of God which seem foolish to them. 1 Corinthians 2.14 talked about that. As a, result, as a result, God gave them over to a depraved mind, according to Romans 1.28. Next, in the third part of verse 5, Paul reveals the condition of false teachers. He declares, and destitute of the truth. Well, let's look at that and see what he's talking about. That term destitute means to steal, rob, deprive, or kept back by fraud. The verb indicates that someone or something pulled these false teachers away from the truth. That does not imply that they were saved, but that they had contact with the truth. Like those described in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, they were thoroughly exposed to it, but rejected it. 
as a result, they have gone and they have gone astray from the truth, according to 2 Timothy 2.18, and are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, according to 2 Timothy 3.7. And then also in 2 Timothy 3.8, Paul writes of them, he says, These men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected as regards to faith. You see, the condition of false teachers is critical. They are in a state of apostasy. They're not saved. They have fallen away from whatever truth they had, and God has turned them over to the church of God. That's in one series. Last, in the fourth part of verse 5, Paul reveals the motive of false teachers. He declares, Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself, he says. These false teachers use the things of God to fill their pockets and grow their personal kingdoms. Have you seen any like that? I've seen many. Yeah, uh, Patty and I were we went over to conference. We were in that we over to um, There's a Heretic false teacher over there, in the south part of, of Columbus. Huge complex. I mean, it is gigantic. This guy's got a house that's worth millions and millions of dollars. And he's the kind of man that when he puts the offering plate out, he doesn't get enough. He puts it back out until he gets what he wants. That's how he's got his millions of dollars. That's how he's got his complex. Yes. I've heard of people. Story that people give him their gold rings and everything, and he put it back out there one more. That's who this is talking about. They're everywhere. They're all over. The so these false teachers use the things of God to fill their pockets. Boy, hot hell is going to be hot for them. Super hot. And grow their personal kingdom. They have a simple motivation it's money. The statement, who supposed that godliness, is used here sarcastically of their false piety. Oh, sometimes they act like they're just holy as a uh, lemon, you know. They're the best things in sliced bread. That's the way they act sometimes, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, no, but uh, they think it, uh, you know, is uh, their gain. Unlike Paul, they cannot say, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. They are not free from the love of money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Yes. Money itself is not evil, right? We need to get that straight. Money is just a thing. It's a, it, it's a substance. It's a paper or it's a, some type of metal. That's all it is. In and of itself, it isn't morally good or bad. It's how it's used, right? And so... It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. We'll talk about that more next week. You see, since these false teachers are spiritually diseased, Paul commanded Timothy, he said, from such withdraw yourself. Throughout history, deadly epidemics have ravaged mankind. More deadly than any of those diseases is the plague of false teaching that has afflicted the church throughout this group. While illness may kill the body, false teaching damns the soul to hell forever. The characteristics of false teachers is clear. They deny the truth, and their teaching does not produce godly living. They are arrogant and ignorant of spiritual truth. They spend their time in foolish speculations that lead only to chaos and division. Having forsaken the truth, they face eternal destruction. And they serve money, not God. The church must take extreme care to, to, not, to not follow these men to spread their deadly disease. Remember, the truth will always set you free and give you a peace that is beyond understanding. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you.
Or the word, or that 